Welcome to this talk by Professor Lee Wei, which is being held as part of the virtual event Abrilin Al Vivo Linguist, Linguists Online, organized by the Brazilian Linguistics Association, Abrilin, in cooperation with a number of other national associations. I'm Caroline Tagg, Secretary of BAL, the British Association of Applied Linguistics, which is based in the UK. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Lee Wei, Director of the Centre for Applied Linguistics at the Institution of Education, University College London, and a leading scholar in the field. His research lies in the broad area of bilingualism and multilingualism, encompassing early second language acquisition, the pragmatics of code switching, speech and language disorders of multilingual speakers, bilingual education, and a focus on, the, on multilingual creativity and criticality. His best-selling books include The Bilingualism Reader and The Cambridge Handbook of Linguistic Multicompetence. However, he's particularly well known in the wider applied linguistics community, at least in recent years, for his development of the concept of translanguaging as a practical theory of language. And his 2014 book, Translanguaging, Language, Bilingualism and Education, which is co-authored with Ophelia Garcia, is a seminal work in this groundbreaking new area of applied linguistics. Today, Li Wei will be talking to us about transing language and cognition, debates and directions of translanguaging research. Thank you very much, Li Wei, and over to you. Thank you, Caroline, for the very kind introduction. I'm just trying to find my PowerPoint in order to share. It was there just now, but somehow it disappeared. I'm not quite sure what to... Really, do you need any help? Yeah, well, it's not... Be, on my... It's because you're left, you left your PowerPoint in presentation mode. Can you try to open it again and go back to Zoom? Okay, apologies for this. No problems. Yeah, I need to uh, get into the system again from a different... Sure. Do, are you back in Zoom? Point. I'm trying to actually get back. I can, I can definitely hear you and... Can you see, see the, the yes, share I, screen I, I, can, I can share now. Oh, great. Okay, it's yeah, working now. I can Thank share you. now. And yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Apologies. Greetings, everyone from London. So many of you will have noticed in the last 10 years or so, the term translanguaging has somehow jumped onto the linguistics discourse stage, seemingly competing with other terms for leading role. If you Google the term translanguaging, you can see over 300,000 appearances and over 15,000 academic publications in Google Scholar contain the term translanguaging. It's not only used in linguistics and applied linguistics work, but also linked to linguistic landscape, visual arts, music, gender studies, etc. And some emphasize the political and ideological dimensions of the act of translanguaging, especially in educational contexts. Now, in today's talk, I'll give you an overview of the rationale for the term. What is it all about and why is it necessary? A brief history of how the term 
developed and evolved over the years. I said it was uh, in the last decade or so that the term seems to somehow uh, to have caught people's imagination, but it was uh, in fact invented in the 1990s in a specific context for a specific reason, which I will explain later. I will also explore the implications of the concept of translanguaging for research on language and cognition. What does the concept afford us to do in research? I have a particular conceptual and methodological concern. And that is, if we conceptualize language as languaging or language in the particular, what are the implications for existing theories of cognitive representation of languages in the bilingual, multilingual mind, brain? Or re and related issues such as the bilingual advantage, linguistic relativity, cross-cultural communication, etc. Uh, what are the implications for the existing theories of language learning, especially the learning of a named language as second foreign or additional language? I see translanguaging as a practical theory of language, as I argued in my 2018 Applied Linguistics paper. A practical theory emphasizes the dependence of theory on practice. That is, theory is based on practice and in turn serves practice. Therefore, the process of theorization or knowledge construction, if you like, involves a perpetual cycle of practice, theory, practice. In contemporary linguistics, this particular way of theorization has its roots in the late Michael Halliday's work. Of course, practical theories have a much longer history in different disciplines, but in, in contemporary linguistics, we can trace it back to uh, Halliday's work, at least. Halliday argued that what we call language in the form of structures of codes is a meaning potential. And linguistics is the study of how people exchange meanings by languaging. I'll have more to say about this later on. Halliday was also a linguist of the Chinese language. And he saw the social semiotic values of Chinese not only in its spoken form, but also its written form. And I remember in one of his lectures he gave in Beijing in the 1980s, he asked the question, what would linguistic theories and models look like if the linguist began with a language like Chinese? Of course, his answer was that it would be a social semiotic approach. Almost 30 years later, my colleagues at UCL working on sign language, sign languages and multimodal communication asked a very similar question. What would theories and models of language and language learning be like if we began with sign languages? I will return to social semiotics and multimodality later, but it's necessary to tell you the kinds of linguistic practice that I'm particularly interested in, in order to build a practical theory of language. I work on bilingualism and multilingualism, not the perfect mastery or balanced mastery of two or more named languages. A complete and balanced bilingual is a myth. Specifically, my interest is in how people who know two or more named languages make meaning and make sense with bits of different named languages in everyday interaction. Here's an example of an exchange between two elderly Singaporeans. I have color coded the nameable languages, but of course, this is deeply problematic as not all the elements are nameable. There are bits that we are not sure what language they are in. And more importantly, the speakers themselves 
do not know and do not even think about which language the different parts are in. They're making meaning coherently and effectively with elements of different named as well as unnamed languages. I stressed that this exchange was between two elderly Singaporeans because this kind of fluid and dynamic language practices that transcends the boundaries of named languages is in fact under threat from the official, much neater bilingualism that the language policies in Singapore are promoting. Here's another example, this time from digital communication, where different scripts representing different named languages are mixed with emoji, colors, images, and other signs to convey meaning in an integrated way. This example is a poster designed by a Singaporean artist. It looks like parallel multilingual sign. But again, elements of different named languages are just, just posed together to make meaning. And a monolingual in a single named language would not be able to make sense of the poster. So how do we analyze such common linguistic practice, practices amongst the vast majority of the world's population were bilingual and multilingual. Clearly naming and counting the languages will not get us very far. And that's why I feel that even terms such as multi, multilingualism can no longer account for this kind of phenomena and the linguistic realities of the 21st century. Post-multilingual individuals, for want of a better term, do not merely use several named languages separately, but also manipulate the spaces between them to advance particular courses, such as the critique of top-down language ideologies. And we also need to account for the discursive experiences that are not exclusively organized by language but through the mobilization of linguistic as well as what has traditionally been termed non-linguistic resources. It is for these reasons that I like the concept of translanguaging, which I must emphasize was not invented by me or any, by any of the active researchers who are using the term these days. But it is a concept that we feel enables us to better understand the kinds of linguistic phenomena that the above examples illustrate. In fact, this talk is all about what translanguaging as a theoretical construct affords me to do and the kinds of theoretical questions it enables me to ask. The trans prefix means transcending the boundaries of named languages as well as the boundaries between language and other cognitive, semiotic, and modal means of sense and meaning making. And the ING highlights what is ongoing and the focuses on the momentariness, instant and transient nature of human communication. Translanguaging is premised on the view that human beings have an innate ability to draw flexibly upon the repertoire of linguistic features, phonetic, morphological, semantic, orthographic, and so forth, that have been assigned by linguists to different named languages, as well as what has been termed extra-linguistic or non-linguistic sense and meaning-making resources, including bodily and sensory resources. Translanguaging, translanguaging is, per, is performative and it, it includes everyday performances in mundane situations. It exudes creativity and criticality, generating positive turbulence to social interaction. Let me now give you an outline of the origin and evolution of the concept of translanguaging. 
as I said earlier, the term was not invented by any of the people who are actively using and developing the concept now, but was coined by Colin Baker in his 2001 textbook, Foundations of Bilingual Education, Bilingualism, where he introduced his former student, Ken Williams' work. Ken Williams was an experienced teacher and teacher trainer, and his doctoral thesis, which was written in Welsh, studied the language policies regarding Welsh revitalization and the pedagogical practices in Welsh medium schools in Wales. In particular, Williams observed a practice where the teacher would give instructions in Welsh, but the pupils, all of whom were bilingual in English and Welsh, and many were English dominant, would respond in English. Similarly, they would read a text in Welsh, but discuss it by mixing Welsh and English together. Rather than seeing such practice simply as a violation of the school policy, which was to use Welsh in teaching and learning, Williams argued that going between and indeed beyond these two named languages in a fluid and dynamic way in the classroom helped to maximize the learner's bilingual ability in learning. Colin Baker, Ken Williams' supervisor, added the trans prefix to an existing term, languaging, to introduce Williams' work in English. It was Ophelia Garcia who, working in the context of bilingual education of minoritized and racialized bilingual learners in the United States talked about translanguaging as multiple discursive practices in which bilinguals engage in order to make sense of the, their bilingual worlds. As a pedagogical practice, translanguaging empowers both the learner and the teacher, transforms the power relations, and focuses the process of teaching and learning on making meaning enhancing experience and developing identity, all essential parts of education. The second area from which translanguaging took inspiration is the work on languaging. When Colin Baker added the trans prefix to languaging, he had in his mind the work on sociocultural theories of second language acquisition particularly Muriel Swain's work on the cognitive processes of negotiating and producing meaningful, comprehensible output as part of language learning, as a means to mediate cognition, that is to understand and to problem solve, and the process of making meaning and shaping knowledge and experience through language. And I particularly like the connection between language and cognizing in Swain's work. But my own work on translanguaging is influenced mostly by the extensive work on languaging by anthropological linguists and distributed cognition researchers. Pete Becker, for example, argued that language should not be regarded as an accomplished fact or a thing made and finished but as in the process of being made. He invited us to think that there is no such thing as language, only continual languaging. And languaging, in Paul Thibault's words, is an assemblage of diverse material, biological, semiotic, and cognitive properties and capacities, which languaging agents orchestrate in real time and across a diversity of time, uh, time scales. This particular perspective seeks to challenge what they call the code view of language that sorts to identify, sought to identify structures divorced from cognitive, affective, and bodily dynamics in real time. In particular, in Thibault's words again, Human languaging activity is radically heterogeneous and in, involves the inter interaction of processes 
on many different time scales, including neural, bodily, situational, social, and cultural processes and events. We therefore need to grant languaging a primacy over what is languished. They invite us to rethink of language, not simply as an organism-centered entity with corresponding formalisms, such as morphemes, words, sentences, etc., but as a multi-scalar organizational processes that enables the bodily and the situated to interact with situation, transcending cultural historical dynamics and pr practices. From this particular perspective, the divides between the linguistic, the paralinguistic, and the extralinguistic dimensions of human communication are nonsensical. For me, adding the trans prefix to languaging emphasizes the full range of linguistic and semiotic performances of multilingual language users for purposes that transcend the boundaries, the combinations of structures the alternation between systems and the transmission of information and the representation of values, identities, and relationships. Translanguaging is transformative. It creates a social space for the multilingual language user by bringing together different dimensions of their personal history, experience, and environment, their attitude, belief, and ideology as well as their cognitive and physical capacity into one coordinated and meaningful performance and making it into a lived experience. At the same time, translanguaging advances two further theoretical arguments relating to hypotheses fundamental to theories of human language and cognition. First, regarding language and thought, Translanguaging argues that multilinguals do not think unilingually, even when they are in the so-called monolingual mode and producing one language only for a specific stretch of speech or text. Second, regarding modularity of mind, the translanguaging perspective argues that human beings think beyond language and thinking requires the use of a variety of cognitive, semiotic, and modal resources of which language in its conventional sense of speech and writing is only one. Let me now expand on these one by one. There seems to be a confusion between the hypothesis that thinking takes place in the language of thought, that is thought possesses a language-like or compositional structure, and that we think in the language we speak, especially in the named or nameable language. So if we speak Arabic, you think in Arabic, which is shown in certain Arabic ways. And if you speak Spanish, you think in Spanish and in a Spanish way. We can see many schemata of cultural thought patterns which are said to be articulated through stereotypical rhetoric patterns. And students of second languages are taught to talk and write in particular ways in the target language to express their thoughts. But there is no such thing as a un uniquely and uniformly Arabic or Spanish way of speaking or thinking, no indeed, a singular English way of speaking or thinking. But going back to the kinds of linguistic practice that I'm interested in, and the examples that I showed you earlier at the beginning of this talk, my question is, what is going on in the speaker's mind when bilingual and multilingual language users are engaged in the bilingual mode or con open control state? It seems the question which, which language is the speaker thinking in when they engage in fluid switching and mixing of different named languages doesn't make any sense. They cannot be said 
to be thinking in a specific named language. The language we individually produce is an idiolect, our own unique personal language. No two idiolects are likely to be the same. And no individual individual, no single individual's idiolect is likely to be the same over time. Otiki et al. argued in their 2015 paper, a bilingual person's idiolect would consist of lexical and grammatical features from different socially and politically defined languages, just as a so-called monolingual's idiolect would consist of lexical and grammatical features from regionally, social class-wise, and stylistically differentiated varieties of the same named language. If we say we thought in the language we spoke, then we think in our idiolect, not a named language. The language of thought in Foda's terms must be independent of these idiolects. We do not think in Arabic, Chinese, Russian, English or Spanish. We think beyond the artificial and political boundaries of named languages in the language of thought. I want to emphasize this is a theoretical argument that is put forward from a translanguaging perspective. Of course, we can develop more empirical work to test, it, to, to test the hypothesis. We must not forget that the names and labels of languages are assigned by linguists to sets of structures that they have identified. These names and labels are cultural political concepts and constructs, often associated with a one nation, one race, and one language ideology. From a historical perspective, human languages evolved from fairly simple combinations of sounds, gestures, icons, symbols, etc., and gradually diversified and diffused due to climate change and population movement. So we can imagine that the climate change deniers and anti-migration brigade will not be pro-language contact or translanguaging. The invention of the nation state also triggered the invention of the notion of monolingualism. What we call translanguage is using one's idiolect, one's linguistic repertoire without regard to the socially and politically defined names, language names and labels. From the translanguaging perspective then, we think beyond the boundaries of named languages. As part of the language socialization process, we become aware of the association between race, nation, community on the one hand, and a set of linguistic features that have been given the name as a language by the linguist on the other. And of the discrepancies between the boundaries in linguistic structural terms versus those in sociocultural and ideological terms. We have a translanguaging instinct that enables us to resolve the differences, discrepancies, inconsistencies, and ambiguities if and when we need to be, they need to be resolved and manipulate them for various and specific communicative and, st and strategic purposes, as in the case of language mixing, borrowing, and switching. Turning to the second hypothesis, my reading of Oda's claim that the human mind consists of a series of innate neural structures or modules, which are encapsulated with distinctive information and for distinctive functions. A language is but one module, does not entail that language and other human cognitive processes are anatomically and or functionally distinct. Guillaume Thierry, a neuroscientist working primarily on bilingualism said, 
Making a distinction between language and the rest of the mind is meaningless. There is no such thing as a language specific brain region. The areas involved in language processing are also activated by numerous nonverbal, auditory, and visual processes. And there is no such thing as a cognitive operation impermeable to or wholly independent of language processing and vice versa. Language processing cannot be wholly independent of auditory and visual processes, just as cognitive processes such as number pro uh, processing and color categorization cannot be wholly independent of language. Language then is a multisensory, a multimodal semiotic system interconnected with other identifiable but inseparable cognitive systems. Translanguaging means transcending the traditional divides between linguistic and non-linguistic cognitive semiotic systems. A cause for a transdisciplinary, not just inter, but trans, as in transcending, approach in research on language and cognition. There is, in fact, ongoing debate over the very existence of the so-called language area of the human brain. Some of the talks in this series address that particular topic. Now, following the language instinct line of inquiry, I have argued that human beings have an innate drive to go beyond narrowly defined linguistic cues and transcend those culturally defined language boundaries in everyday social interaction. A principle of abundance is in operation in human communication in real life social contexts. Multiple cues, verbal, gestural, bodily, etc., are present simultaneously in producing a message, in meaning making. Human beings have a natural instinct to draw on as many different sensory, modal, cognitive, and semiotic resources as available to them to interpret the meaning intentions while assessing the relative relevance and significance of the different cues. Cues complement and compensate each other. Human beings read them in a coordinated manner rather than singularly. We need a maximalist approach to human communication with specific regard to implicture and inference. And translanguaging offers such an approach. As a practical theory of language, Translanguaging embraces the notion of multi multimodality, in particular, the social semiotic approach to multimodality. As my late colleague Gunter Kress argued, linguistic signs are part of a wider repertoire of modal resources that carry particular socio-historical and political associations that sign makers use to serve strategic purposes. Translanguaging foregrounds the different ways language users employ, create, and interpret different kinds of signs to communicate across contexts and participants to perform subjectivities. And translanguaging highlights the way in which multilinguals make use of the tensions and conflicts amongst different signs because of the socio-historical associations the signs carry with them in a cycle of re -semiotization. It's important to emphasize that translanguaging does not deny the existence of named languages. Quite the opposite, in fact. We stress that named languages are historical and political and are historically, politically, and ideologically defined entities. As I mentioned before, research on language evolution and in historical linguistics shows that all human languages 
evolved from fairly simple combinations of sounds, gestures, icons, symbols, etc. There is also ample research evidence from neuroscience that differently named languages are not represented or controlled by different parts of the brain. Efforts to identify and locate the switch in the brain between different languages when bilinguals and multilingual language users are engaged in language alternation proved to be futile. A bilingual multilingual is someone who is aware of the existence of the political entities of named languages, has acquired some of their structural features through socialization, and has an ability to use them fluidly in a context sensitive manner. We fully accept that there are many language users whose environment and experience led them to heightened awareness of the differences between named languages, who subsequently keep their languages separate in daily use. For some, the writing system has had a major impact on their language awareness and differentiation. Nevertheless, their language awareness is not solely of linguistic structures, but includes the sociocultural and the political histories and values of the named languages. Their cognitive representation includes this awareness and is at least in part a result of experience and environment and is subject to change over time. Bilinguals and multilinguals will exercise different cognitive control in selective language use, one language at a time, versus fluid language use, as in translanguaging, including the written mode. What is cognitive when we talk about cognitive representation of languages, therefore, is also sociocultural and sociopolitical. So let me conclude now. Humans have been communicating through a combination of means, verbal, visual, bodily, symbolic, with or without instruments since the very beginning of time. It was much later when linguists label certain sets of verbal structures as languages, and even later, designed written system, writing systems for some of the named languages. The naming of language is a sociopolitical act and has sociopolitical consequences. Humans will continue to communicate beyond the artificial boundaries between named languages and through a variety of modularities. With enhanced human mobility and migration and the advancement of media technologies, the means by which we communicate with each other can only be further diversified. So for me, translanguaging compels us to rethink human communication as a more complex kind of discourse, one that is intensively worked through by named languages, language varieties, and registered, registers, but also by multiple mo modalities and medialities, all of which are engaged in tandem by language users in meaning making and sense making of their uh, social world. Translanguaging also urges us to rethink the relationship between language and cognition, not in a simplistic one named language, one thought pattern way, but in much more multidimensional and integrated manner. It's intended to raise new questions about some of the fundamental issues regarding human communication and cognition. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lee Wei, for that uh, very exciting and, and very thorough talk. I'm going to um, raise a couple of questions with you, if that's OK. Um, we have one in the chat from Aline Larandi. How do we study linguistic awareness from a translanguaging perspective? Thank you. That's a really good question. I think the, I, I, first of all, I, let me say I'm not an expert on language awareness research. Uh, and there is a long tradition of research on uh, language awareness. And the research is extended to bilingual and multilingual uh, language users. My understanding of it is um, traditionally it's been looked at primarily from a ling linguistic structure perspective. Uh, and also the cognitive representation of languages. Uh, there isn't enough research, at least uh, as I, uh, I'm aware, of the uh, sociocultural dimensions of language awareness. What does it mean uh, by knowing or using a particular named language in that particular commu community? Uh, the, the, the histories of that language, the sociocultural histories of that language, the political dimensions and the political uh, uh, connotations of, uh, of the language and the, the linguistic ideologies and, and, and uh, um, policies associated with different uh, language and language varieties. I guess from a translanguaging perspective, we want to highlight the uh, sociopolitical dimensions of named languages and uh, ask questions, what is happening uh, uh, and why uh, some bilinguals keep their languages, named languages apart, whereas, whereas others uh, might want to um, mix them and uh, exchange them uh, more on a regular basis. Thank you. I think there's a follow up question from Aline and apologies, everyone, if I'm pronouncing your names wrongly. Um, Aline also asks, how do we evaluate or assess students knowledge thinking of foreign language learning in a translanguaging perspective? Yeah, again, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, uh, assessing uh, again, we want to, um, uh, we're promoting a maximalist approach and holistic uh, approach to uh, linguistic knowledge. Uh, therefore, it should not be uh, solely uh, focused on uh, knowledge of linguistic structures. I think that's the, that's the most important dimension of uh, the translanguaging uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, it's basically what we uh, really want to uh, argue is um, we need to critique the uh, some of the assumptions in the uh, study of uh, linguistic knowledge in in assessment and in in, in testing, uh, including uh, the assumption that somehow if you are a so-called native speaker, you you know everything about the language. Whereas uh, if you are a second uh, or foreign language uh, user, you, you are never going to, or it's going to take a very, very long time for you to have a complete knowledge of that language. Uh, we, we are uh, questioning the, the concept of, uh, or the idea that somehow one can have a complete knowledge, uh, the kind of uh, completeness based uh, models of language proficiency or language uh, competence is something that translanguaging and in fact other concepts like multi-competence uh, that we've been called, uh, pr uh, promoted um, are uh, aiming to, uh, to question. Thanks very much. I have another question from Aline Bieri. How would you empirically analyze translanguaging practices, maybe even quantitatively, or is this mutually exclusive with the idea of languages having no boundaries? No, I don't think they are mutually exclusive. In, in, in terms of um, uh, uh, empirically uh, um, testing, I don't know whether you, uh, you mean uh, testing the idea 
of uh, not um, having boundaries in the human mind uh, regarding languages or testing uh, the actual practice of, of translanguage. Of course, there are, there are uh, just ample examples of uh, how bilinguals and multilinguals uh, move between and beyond uh, named languages in uh, everyday practice. So uh, in terms of practice, there's ample examples. In terms of the uh, um, uh, boundaries between languages in the in the perhaps in in the human mind. Uh, I, well, the, the, there there is plenty of um, research evidence to uh, suggest that named in the named languages are not listed as separate named languages in the human mind, and there is no as I as I suggested there is no uh, specific brain areas or neural networks representing a named language. The, 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 I mean, yeah, I, I won't be able to go into any of the empirical details of these studies, but there is plenty of work there uh, get providing evidence to suggest that people don't really have these named, the boundaries of named languages in, in in their cognitive representation. Another question from Antonio Lafuria. Please, can you talk further about top-down ideologies? I don't know if you have anything in particular in mind there, Antonio. Otherwise, I'll hand over to you, Li Wei. Sorry, I, I uh, yeah, I, I need, could you repeat that? I didn't quite get yeah. it. Uh, can you say something more about top-down ideologies? That's the extent of the question. So I'm not sure if, Antonio, you yeah, have something I in mean, particular the, in mind. Uh, well, uh, okay. the... Of course, the... the, the uh, notion of translanguaging came out of context, from context, where there are clear uh, and dominant uh, language ideologies and top-down ideologies in education and in other uh, uh, contexts. And the idea of translanguaging is very much uh, uh, about creating spaces to fight against some of these dominant ideologies. Uh, to treat all languages as equal contributors to human communication and uh, uh, you know question some of the values and value judgment by people of the different named languages so it, it, it really is uh, ideological in many ways uh, but of course uh, one can look at it from different perspectives not always ideological but the act of translanguaging we have argued that it, it, it is, uh, it has that uh, uh, consequence and it's certainly significant implications for uh, language policy and language ideology. Okay, should we just take a couple more questions and, and finish there? Sure. So um, another question, sorry, just having a look at the chat. Um, We have one question um, from Anderson Marquez. What sort of impact do you see from the introduction of translanguaging perspectives into the language education context? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, language, uh, well, translanguaging has been used um, as both um, uh, a theoretical and uh, policy and practi practical uh, uh, concept in a number of fields. I think it is absolutely right uh, it, that in education, uh, translanguaging has had the most impact, especially on the um, monolingual uh, policies of language education. If you look at uh, bilingual education uh, or language education of bilingual 
uh, minoritized uh, learners. A huge amount of work has uh, gone into it, looking at uh, how um, the um, possibility or the opportunities for the learners to use their home languages, community languages in mainstream education context can enhance their learning. Uh, can absolutely enhance their learning as well as uh, enhancing their uh, identity and subjectivity and self-confidence, etc. Um, uh, but also in uh, foreign language uh, education, there's increasing uh, interest in using translanguaging as a pedagogical approach to fight against, again, the monolingual uh, approach to language education. Uh, and we uh, must remind ourselves the purpose of learning uh, any uh, additional language uh, is to become bilingual and multilingual, um, not to forget uh, or replace one's first language, not to become another monolingual in the so-called target language. So we need to really use bi bilinguals and multilinguals in their everyday life as examples, as, as the uh, as a target for learning, target for uh, language education. And bilinguals and multilinguals use their uh, language resources as well as other resources flexibly and uh, fluidly, as in uh, the case I, I showed you in translanguaging. And that has to be one of the uh, objectives of teaching and learning, rather than uh, uh, assuming that they can be another monolingual in the target language and use a monolingual native speaker as the example in foreign uh, and additional language education. So there are huge implications in these educational contexts. Of course, every educational context is slightly different. We have to look at the history, look at the social uh, uh, structure and look at the ideologies and policies. But it is in, in the education context that translanguaging has had the most uh, um, uh, significant impact. Perhaps an interesting follow-up question to that is this one from Maria Bardas. What skills can multilinguals transfer from their linguistic flexibility and code switching to other behaviours? Yeah, that's a really uh, uh, interesting question. Uh, in uh, Perhaps not quite in the um, uh, linguistics uh, field, but uh, in in uh, psychology and, and uh, other uh, fields, there is uh, emerging evidence uh, to suggest uh, bilinguals and multilinguals or speakers who uh, use their languages flexibly, um, mm -hmm. certainly in the controlled laboratory uh, conditions, perform better uh, in in uh, cognitive uh, flexibility tasks and multitasking, etc. Uh, so they show certain cognitive advantages uh, in in performing these tasks, and they uh, the, the implication of these findings would uh, seem to suggest that uh, people who are uh, habitually engaged in translanguaging practices may well have a cognitive and social advantage. Uh, in dealing with uh, um, complexities and difficulties and dealing with the fact uh, that people move between uh, different jobs uh, very often in, 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 in the 21st century and also have to adapt to different cultures and societies uh, um, uh, rather rapidly because people move around and have uh, multiple encounters with multiple people. So uh, the uh, flexible use of, of uh, multiple languages may well help to develop skills that are needed for uh, working and socializing in the 21st century. Thanks very much. I feel that we can't let you go without asking this final question, which Saran Han has posed, which is what are the differences between code switching and translanguaging? <laughs> and I, it sort of links to an earlier question as well, which is how would you respond to criticism to translanguaging brought forward by for, by, for instance, the code switching community in that translanguaging is nothing new compared to existing code switching research? Yeah. 
uh, again, I, th I have uh, uh, tried to explain uh, uh, at least my understanding of the differences between these terms are what the theoretical and analytical affordances these terms actually offer us. Uh, in my uh, blog piece uh, associated with uh, uh, applied linguistics, the Applied Linguistics Journal uh, run by the uh, Oxford University Press. So if you want to have a look there, for me, uh, uh, translanguaging was never ever intended to replace any other term. Uh, you know, m lots of the uh, people who are using the translanguaging terminology uh, never actually use code switching or anything else. Uh, I have used uh, the term code switching and I continue to use the term code switching for a very different uh, uh, purpose and for specific context. I don't see any contradictions there. I see translanguaging as a very different analytical approach uh, to uh, the phenomena that I'm interested in. I don't think uh, code switching uh, for my uh, taste offers me the same kind of uh, analytical affordance uh, and possibilities uh, uh, in interpreting the, the linguistic phenomena that I'm interested in. So, uh, you know, I want to keep it fairly simple because we, uh, there is no point of uh, engaging in a, con a convoluted uh, discussion here. Uh, I, I, I hear what uh, some of the uh, um, colleagues working with the concept of, of code switching uh, are saying, if they think uh, the concept absolutely affords them to do everything they want, that is absolutely fine. I don't think it does to, to me. So I want to use uh, translanguaging because it, it enables me to do certain things that I personally find code switching does not allow me to do. Thanks very much again, Li Wei. Um, and thanks to everybody for so many questions and apologies if there's a couple that we haven't answered, but I think you answered quite a few there, Li Wei. Uh, thank so you thank for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, but particularly thank you, Li Wei, for an inspiring and really interesting talk. Thank you. All the best to all of you. <laughs>